Institute. But, um, the University of Cincinnati collection was merged with the uh, Museum Center collection, and that created a problem in that there was a, a two different numbering systems. It turned out that um, the university system was more extensive and could be uploaded into a computer program. So we're going back through every drawer and renumbering the museum center specimens and picking up the ones, quite frankly, not every one of the UC specimens were numbered. So there are boxes, they're, they're like jewelry cases, and they may have one fossil in them, they may have 10, uh, some, I, one that counted, it was 427. Uh, back on the weights, uh, all from one place. But each of them hopefully has a label in it. And of course, we are now taking in a logbook, a ledger, and handwriting, copying off the existing labels. And so I am seeing labels of 100 years old, 50 years old. I'm seeing things that were written on uh, just uh, bank uh, statements, back of bank statements, you know, Montgomery and. Uh, Pfeiffer Road in a ditch, uh, that's, that's the label, you know. Um, I've seen the good, the bad, and the ugly. And I can tell you what happens after these things are re-entered by hand in the ledger book. We then enter all that information into a computer program. And it's really when it's in that computer program that, of course, we can sort the data. If you want to look at a particular type of brachiopod, like uh, Platystrophia laticosta, you can hit the button, you know, type that in, hit the button, and it'll tell you every lot that has that, that uh, particular fossil. Uh, and all the information that's with it once you have the number. Now, the, univer the uh, Museum Center collection down there is done by, by phylum, uh, genus, taxa, uh, but that, some, some collections aren't that way. Some, some collections, if you came in with your collection, donated it, they would keep it intact, which may have a kind of derms it may have, brachiopods it may have, you know, ferns it may, who knows what. And obviously if you're a researcher and you're generally going to be researching a particular type of organism, having it the, the way I described of just one lump that came from some person is difficult. If you have it already stratified by phylums and, and uh, genus and uh, species, you got a fighting chance of getting what you want. So the other, the other question you have to ask yourself is, okay, I collect all this stuff. I spent a lot of time on doing this. What am I going to do with it all? You know, it's great stuff. But maybe my children will love it, and they'll take care of it. But too often what we find is so-and-so is a collector. They're, you know, 87 years old. they got to move into the retirement home. The kids are going through their stuff. They find these bags of fossils. And they bring them down to the museum center and say, here it is. Now, one, a couple things can happen. It's well labeled. Even if they aren't pristine specimens, they'll probably be kept. If they are just bags of fossils, chances are they're going to be politely denied or, or you know, rejected. Uh, the museum center does not have to take your collection. So your labeling is going to make a difference of whether anybody takes your your fossils. Uh, and the better job you do of labeling, uh, the better off a chance you've got of getting them in there if that's where you want them to go. Uh, having said that, uh, I must say that there are some fairly famous names that you've heard Dr. Davis talk about, the Cincinnati School, whatever. I've seen their fossils. Some of them got crummy labels. You know, <laughs> they really are bad. Uh, others, there's a, a man named Max Koff that gave a great deal of information or, or material to the museum center. He, he kept meticulous notes of where he collected everything, collected from a lot of places, and they're very, they're very good labels. They're, they follow what I'm about to say here. Anyway, what's the most important thing uh, when you're making a label? The most important is the location because you're the only one that knows that. Think about it. If you have a Platystrophia ponderosa, an expert's going to look at it and say, yeah, I know what that is. I, if you called it a uh, Platystrophia a lot, of, a lot of costa, they can look at it real quick and say, nah, he, you know, he's close, but that's not what it is. But the one thing he won't know, or she won't know, where was it found? And the more you can put in there 
in your label, the better. You definitely want to put the country, the state, the province, the county, and if you can, the nearest city, town, or place it was found. Uh, an example would be Cincinnati, Hamilton County, Ohio, USA. Uh, if it's not in a uh, city or a town, use the nearest city or town because the, the computer program actually has every city or town location that we've got on the label in the computer with all that information about you know country, county, state in there. So if you wanted to search on Hamilton County, it would pop everything out of Hamilton County. But uh, now. This description, one and a half miles northeast of the north side of Tucson, that's nice, it's good, but think about it. The north side of Tucson, you think Tucson's just a nice square? Mm -mm. It's, it's getting you close, but the north side of Tucson may be very irregular, and there's a lot of places it could be. So that's a good description, but it isn't great. Obviously, if you can get GPS coordinates, a lot of people don't have the equipment, you can't do it, but if you can, it's great. I mean, that would be the ideal. You put that on there. Uh, then, once you get, you know, the location, then the exact place in the location where you collected the fossil. Uh, example, the uh, road cut across from, the, that's just an address I made up, on the second bench from the bottom. What's a bench? Well, if you know most road cuts, you look at them, they cut up and then they cut in, and then they cut up and they cut in. Those flat areas they cut on are benches. And people will say, I collected on the second bench. The trouble is they don't say for the second bench from the top, the second bench from the bottom. <coughs> Conventionally, it's from the bottom. And if you're going to guess, you're going to think it's from the bottom. But it's always, you know, put the words in. You know, even if you had to put from F-R-B-O-T, somebody will figure out what that is. Uh, now, what's imp other important things, if you know the rock unit, if, if you know this, fine. Uh, this is an example of the way we would describe one we know. Coryville member of the Fairview Formation. And those are actually time units. Late order division. All this up to here is time unit. This is the same thing said that the rock, rock layers. But if you got, I mean, it's not unusual that we'll see Coryville member of the Maysvillian stage. All right, we know enough around here to know what that is. But whatever, whatever you think, and, and one way to find out what this stuff is, look in the dry dredger bulletin if you go on a field trip. I, most of them, when they describe the uh, location we're going on a field trip, will also describe what layers it is, what's, what's the formation, so that you don't have to be a genius. Now, I will admit that over a period of time, sometimes the formations at a particular location seem to migrate up and down the, the column. But, but nevertheless... <laughs> If you give a good location, somebody can go back out there who knows what they're talking about and figure out what it really is. Uh, another thing, the collector's name and the date collected. Now, uh, most of us are fairly vain. And we like to have our name, and, and we really do in the book, blog book and the computer, put the collector's name in. I mean, I recognize a lot of old dry dredgers, some of the old so-called Cincinnati school. U.P. James, uh, Butcher, who used to be a professor here, uh, uh, other names that uh, you, would, you would recognize. But, and the date collected, because that helps with the description. When you say one half mile on the northeast side of Tucson, well, Tucson in 1920 might have been one place, and Tucson in the 1980s another place. So if you put the date, it gives people a fighting chance. The, the other reason you put the, we put the collector's name in, what happens? You, you're, you go into the retirement community, your kids take the stuff down and give it to the museum, the museum puts it away. 20 years later, the kid says, you know, I think Grandpa had, gave stuff to the museum center. No, come down, they want to see it. Well, in the past, they had trouble, they couldn't find it. And people say, I've thrown it all out. Well, they didn't throw it out, they just didn't have a good system to retrieve it. With the computer system, if we put in John Tate, it's going to pop everything out of there that I've, I've donated. It'll give and the number of every specimen they can go right to the drawers and, and pull them out. And I know they're there. There's five or six things I've donated and I've cataloged two of them. So. Uh, the least important thing is the scientific name of the fossil. And most, most collectors, 
think this is the most important. It isn't. Because the experts can look at what